Hello, welcome to 3ABN Today Bible Q&A. My name is Angela Lomake. I'm glad that you have tuned in. You. You're gonna be blessed by this program. Well, this is a program where you get your Bible questions answered. And if you have questions that you would like to send in to us, you can do that by going to BibleQA at 3ABN.TV, or you can phone, send your text to 618-228-3975. Well, before we get into the program, allow me to introduce our panel. And today we have Shelly Quinn. Shelly? Glad to be here. What do you like about Q&A? I like what I learn. Mm. You know, it's, it's fun to research some questions maybe that you don't know, but I really learn yeah. from everybody that we sit with. Um, none of us can ever know too much about the Word of God. Mm -hmm. That's true. Amen. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Pastor James Rafferty, welcome. Thank you. It's really good to be here. Isn't it? Yes. <laughs> And what do you like about Bible Q&A? Well, what I like, Angie, is the opportunity to help people yeah. to try to understand difficult questions that may be yeah. troubling and bothering them. That was my problem, and, and it has been my problem with the Bible, is I come across something, I just, yeah. what does this mean? Right. And when you get an answer to something like that, it really can change your whole focus and relationship with God. Amen. You could that. always learn something new, mm -hmm. huh, in the Word of mm -hmm. God. I know I do. All right, and across from me is my sweetheart, Pastor John Lomakang. Yes. Welcome. And what do you like about Bible Q&A? Well, to me, the Bible is an ocean. And every time I go in, I realize I don't have enough oxygen. I always <laughs> learn something more. It's so deep Amen. that um, people ask questions that sometimes sound basic. But when we do the research, like one of the questions I have today, when we do the research, it opens yeah. up something that That's I never true. knew. Yeah. And so thank you for challenging us. It's also helping us to learn more. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you for your support of 3ABN, this worldwide ministry, and especially your prayers. Bef speaking of prayers, I'm gonna ask Shelley Quinn to oh, open with prayer. Would love to. Our glorious and wonderful Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord, we dedicate this time to you. We ask in the name of Jesus, help us to be out of the way. Speak through us, send your Holy Spirit to anoint us and to anoint every ear that hears, including ours. Father, we love your word. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And help us all to understand by the power of the Holy Spirit. We give you all the praise, all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, the pro program format is three minutes for each question. And we also have a four minute question, answer I should say, not a question. And so right now we're gonna start with our first question. Honey, you're gonna get the four minute one. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Why do Seventh-day Adventists adhere to certain laws, eating of clean animals, while not others mix in fabrics? It seems like Masonic Judaism as acceptable an acknowledgement of Christ, however, still observing Jewish practices. This is Jacoby from Oklahoma. Now, thank you for the question, Jacoby. This is one of those questions I talked about that helps us learn something that is not a part of our daily intellect. Mm. I did some research and we have to go back now. Not, uh, not today where fabrics are all on a large spool in factories and we just pick the different colors, the silks, the wool, the rayon, the polyesters, the, the, the mixed fabrics. But go back to the time where they literally had to kill an animal mm. to make a garment. And according to the Jews, if you mixed the different skins, they said they wore differently. Hmm. When they dried, some dried quicker than others, hmm. some stretched quicker, some shrunk more than others. Mm -hmm. And so when you go back, uh, Josephus, the historian, and a number of other uh, Hebrew writers contribute to the fact that in the Hebrew economy, even in the sanctuary services, they believe that in order for the garment to maintain its longevity, that they should not mix different animal skins together. The other aspect of it was when the Hebrews were in Egypt, uh, they got their fabrics from the markets in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And they chose uh, fabrics that were identified as closely as it possibly could be 
to the kind of fabrics they had when they were in their own land. Mm. And so whenever they mixed fabrics, they said, don't mix a Hebrew fabric mm. with an Egyptian fabric. Mm. And they believed that to be mixing the holy with the unholy. It's very, very interesting to see how they did that. So uh, Rabbi Abraham Isaac Kook suggested that wearing wool from sheep at some level is a form of theft mm. uh, or if you wore from uh, different animals. Mm. So they had their traditional beliefs that prevented them from mixing these fabrics together. But that was not the same principle when it came to deciding what to eat, mm. because deciding what to eat was established long before Jews even existed. As a matter of fact, in Genesis 1:29, the Lord, speaking to Adam and Eve, said, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. It's long before the Jews existed. There were no Jews in existence at all. And so the foods that we adhere to or practice uh, in a health way as Seventh-day Adventists, we try to trace it back to creation. Mm -hmm. And we know that we're thousands of years removed. We have GMOs and all that type of chemical enhancements today. But still, the Lord made a distinction between the clean and the unclean and the food that was healthier for pre-sin man. And then even though he added vegetables and post the post flood era, mm -hmm. still today, the cleanest and the healthiest diet are those of fruits, grains, vegetables, nuts. Mm -hmm. And although we, although we like soda and I, I confessed how I like barbecue potato chips, yeah. I'm learning how to get over <laughs> eating all of that. Um, even though that is not a sin in and of itself, the Lord made it very clear, even to the generation of Noah. In Genesis 7, verse 2, you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and this female, to each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Why? Because on the other side of the flood, vegetation would be destroyed. And the Lord designated long before Jews, clean animals and unclean animals. And when you do the research, all the hard shell animals in the ocean, all the hard shell fish are God's sanitation department. Mm -hmm. The pigs are scavengers. Most of the birds of prey are scavengers, except for chicken and turkey. Uh, but you find that the Bible clearly in Deuteronomy 14 and Leviticus chapter 11 outlines the dietary principles. But what's the overriding factor? 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, mm -hmm. do all to the glory of God. Our bodies is a residing place of the Holy Spirit. And you'll find the healthier the body, as in Daniel's day, the clearer the mind, the greater the intellect, and the better God can communicate with us and we can communicate with the Lord. Amen. So the dietary foods were not just for the Jews, were oh, they? Oh, not at all. They were just stewards of that mm. to let the world know and understand through what God entrusted to them mm. how we should eat. Like the Bible says, I, I pray that you prosper and be in health right. even as your soul prospers. Mm. Thank you so much for that. You're Great. Welcome. Okay. Here we go. Pastor Rafferty, here's your question. Yes. You have an interesting question. <laughs> it is interesting. Isn't I had it? to look this one up. <laughs> Can you explain 1 Timothy 5, verse 23? Andy from West Salem, Illinois. All right, Andy from West Salem, Illinois. Yes, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23, <laughs> here's what it says. Drink no longer water, mm -hmm. but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. That's the King James Version. You know, the other day, my wife and I were eating grapes, and mm -hmm. she said to me, you are eating resveratrol. Resveratrol, mm -hmm. you're eating resveratrol. Wow, well, what is that? And it's good for you, she said. Uh -huh. My wife always tells me when I'm eating food that's good for me. Yes. Right? <laughs> so this is an ingredient in grapes that is really good for your health. It's called resveratrol. Mm -hmm. And some people think that because fermented grapes or alcohol mm. are beneficial to you, that's what the research says, mm -hmm. that it's good to drink a little wine every once in a while, a little alcohol every once in a while, but it's actually the resveratrol that is the good part. Yeah. And you don't need to ferment grapes or fermented wine in order to get that good part and the benefits of that good part. So some even say that, uh, you know, fermented wine is good for you because um, it helps you relax or it helps, re you know, relieve the um, stress mm -hmm. of the day or et cetera. Well, whenever I'm studying alcohol in the Bible, I like to share with people two verses. The first one is found in Proverbs chapter 31. And I'll just begin with verse 4. It says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine, for, nor for princes strong drink. Mm -hmm. Verse 5, Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert 
the judgment of any of the afflicted. So God is saying here very clearly we shouldn't be drinking alcohol, we shouldn't be drinking fermented wine. Then he goes on in verse 16, he says, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, mm -hmm. and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Now this, this verse, verse 6, is a difficult one because you're thinking, wait a minute, God is saying that we should actually give alcohol and wine to people? Well, the reason people drink primarily is to forget their troubles. The reason people drink primarily is it's uh, what we call a comfort. That's, there's some alcohol that's actually called Southern Comfort. Mm -hmm. And the point is, is that God has called us to be kings and, pri and priests. Mm -hmm. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, it says we're kings and priests, a, a chosen generation, and we are not perishing. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we have a comforter, and that comforter is Jesus. And Jesus has given us the Holy Ghost to comfort us. So when you're going through stress, and when you're going through trials, and when you're having a difficult time, don't turn to the bottle, don't turn to, turn to alcohol. You can get all of the benefit uh, from those grapes without the alcohol. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. give your troubles, your burdens to Him, and let Him be the one who takes all of that stress away yes. from you. Do not act as though you're perishing and turn to alcohol, but turn to your Savior, Jesus Christ. Well said. So many people go for a glass of wine mm -hmm. <laughs> before they go to bed, right? Uh, to relax them. They don't need it. Mm -hmm. As you said, the Word, you need the Lord, the Holy you need Spirit. a glass of prayer. <laughs> a glass of Amen, prayer. a glass of prayer before you go to bed, not the wine. Thank you for that. Okay, Mrs. Shelley Quinn, here it goes. Here's your question. I was recently baptized and my head was covered with a shower cap. Why was my head covered? And because of this, am I truly baptized? I am asking this because I've never seen anyone baptized with a covering to protect their hair. This is Annette from Brooklyn, New York. Oh, Annette. Annette, you're looking at somebody who's been baptized four times. <laughs> Once when I was 12, because that was the time that you made that decision. Mm -hmm. Didn't take, though, I'll tell you why in a minute. Mm -hmm. Once when I was 18, because in a New Testament church, I heard a sermon that if I hadn't been uh, baptized correctly, I was going straight to you know where. Mm -hmm. Once when I was 28, because I went down to join a, uh, the membership in a church that had been Baptist and now was non-denominational, and they dunked me before I knew what oh. happened. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. <laughs> and then... The time I was truly baptized was when I was 38 years old. I'm going to tell you up front, a hair covering does not make a difference between you being accepted to the Lord. Are you truly baptized? Only one way can we tell if you are truly baptized. Here is what the Lord opened to me and made me realize I'd never really been baptized those first three times. Romans chapter 6. We'll begin with verse 4. Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore you were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Mm. Baptism represents the burial, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism in, when we are truly baptized, it is because we went into uh, this practice understanding what was about to happen to us. He says, for if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, mm -hmm. that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Yeah. Annette, if you went to your baptism, realizing that God was doing something in you, that he'd done a change, and you're there to say, Lord, I'm here to identify with you. I am laying down my old life, that old self. Mm -hmm. It's being buried under the water. I'm going to be resurrected, Lord, united with you then you're truly baptized. Mm -hmm. And it says in verse 7, I've got just a little time, so I'll read it. He who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we know that we shall also live with him. Mm -hmm. Baptism is a white funeral. 
Baptism is laying down an old life. And if you did that and were ready to raise and walk in newness of life, then you're truly baptized. Amen. Amen. That's right. And it doesn't matter if your head is covered, does it? To be baptized. I, I don't think God's up there yeah. saying, whoops, her hair didn't exactly. get wet. Exactly. Yeah. When I got baptized, I had a, a swimming cap on. <laughs> <laughs> and I was baptized and God accepted my baptism. Praise the Lord. Well, if you've just tuned in and you have questions that you would like to send in to us, you can email us at BibleQA at 3ABN.TV or you can text us your question to 618-228-3975. All right, here we go. Uh, Pastor John, my sweetie, are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> okay, here we go. In Isaiah 59, 18, God tells us that we will be punished according to our deeds. And I'm wondering, does that mean people that did horrible things will get horrible repayment for what they did, not just simply die in the fire? This is from a viewer in California. Okay, wow. You know, that's a, that's a very good question. <laughs> yeah. uh, to some degree, it's rhetorical because you, you answered it, uh, excluding the word horrible. Uh, each of us will be rewarded according to our deeds. Mm. And let me qualify that. The righteous are not rewarded according to their deeds because there's no deed we can do to purchase eternal life. Mm, right. It's a gift to the righteous. Mm, right. This, when it talks about Revelation, particularly Re Re Revelation chapter 20 and all the passages in the Bible, uh, Revelation 22 verse 12, uh, you find Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 and 14. Let me just read that for you. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12 verse 13 and 14. It says, um, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. So yes, the basis, our works are going to be examined. And if we have not repented, then we will have to face the penalty of the decisions that we have made in life. That's why Peter said the answer is repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. That was in Acts 3 and verse 19. So instead of fearing the judgment and fearing what's going to come our way because we think, wow, I've done some horrible things, the best decision is to repent and be converted. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But let me go ahead and answer the questions to support the fact that each one of us will face the reward of or the negative impact of our decisions. Mm. Matthew 12, verse 36. But I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Mm. So I always said the saying that uh, I repeat it for you, uh, whatever you say, make it soft and sweet <laughs> because one day you may have to swallow it. <laughs> uh, so, but think about what you say. Mm. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad or good or evil, based on whatever translation you read. And then Revelation 20, this is often referred to as the great white throne judgment. More specifically, those who come up in the second resurrection, Revelation 20, verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another, another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. Mm. So you see those who have not accepted Christ, those whose sins have not been forgiven, will have to face their deeds in the resurrection. Mm. So it is, it is sensible. I mean, the most sensible thing to do is to follow 1 John 1, 9. Confess, Amen. God will forgive you. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then according to the Bible, you will have boldness in the day of judgment. That's right. That is fearlessness. <laughs> Amen. Mm. And I, I'm glad you said 1 John 1, 9. We have to repent, right? That's right. Confess. Confess, Confess to mm. one another and to God. That's yeah. right. Thank you for that. Mm. Okay. Pastor Rafferty, here we go. Number two. Probation is, quote unquote, closed at a certain point in the Bible. Mm. But isn't probation closed for each of us at the time of death? This is from Terry in Ohio. Yes, Terry in Ohio, that's a really good point. Probation 
does close for each one of us at death. We have a verse for that. It's found in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Let me just read it to you. It says, as it is uh, appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So death seals up our fate. Yes. If we have not make a made a decision mm -hmm. for Christ, by the time we die, our fate is sealed. Mm. And the next thing we're going to know is the judgment. And of course, some folks will close their probation before death. It's mm. possible for us, according to the Bible, to commit what we call the unpardonable sin or the mm. sin against the Holy Spirit. Yes. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32, and you can read the references there. But the thing that we need to look at more closely is this final close of probation. So we want to make a decision, of course, before we die. We want to make a decision for Christ because once we die, probation is closed as far as our decision making goes. We don't want to make a decision to reject the Holy Spirit who seeks to convict us and lead us to Jesus. But at a certain time in history, probation is going to close, generally speaking. And that is found in Revelation chapter 22. There are other places where we can see this, but Revelation 22 is the clearest. It says here in verse 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his works or as his works shall be, as John was just sharing. Yes. So. Jesus Christ is going to look out upon planet Earth. He's mediating right now His blood in behalf of sinners. And He is going to look out on planet Earth one day after there's a great test that's going to come upon this whole world. And He's going to say, you know what, if I kept probation open for another year or another month or another week or another day or another minute or another second, it wouldn't make any difference. Mm. He that is holy is going to be holy still. Mm. He that is righteous is going to be righteous Absolutely. still. He that is filthy is going to be filthy still. We're just going to close this up. Might as well head on in and bring those people home who decided for me and let the people receive the consequences of their choices who've decided against me. So right now we need to think about this and we need to realize that the reason why we're still here, the reason why probation lingers mm -hmm. is because 2 Peter 3, 9 says, yes. God is long suffering yes. toward us. Yes. That's right. Context of that, hey, where's the promise of his coming? Everything's continued. Mm -hmm. Well, our fathers fell asleep and they were thinking I wouldn't even make it to college, you know, and here I am, you know, I'm getting ready to retire. Why hasn't Jesus come yet? Because God is long suffering to us. He's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's right. God is wanting, He's yearning for the hearts of every individual. And as we read there in Revelation chapter 22, He's not, he's not going to close it up mm -hmm. until the time when it won't make any difference, when no changes will be made, when no one's going to decide for or against Him, and then He's going to close it all up. So make a decision for Jesus Christ while probation still lingers. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Well said. I love the way you answer that. Make your calling and election sure, listener. Thank you for that. Okay, Shelley, you got the baptism questions. <laughs> <laughs> I did, didn't I? This is our second one. Here it is. Is it a requirement to be baptized by immersion to enter heaven? This is from Judy in Texas. Okay, Judy, I want to hit this from two different directions. Is baptism a part of our salvation and is baptism by immersion? I wasn't quite certain what you were asking, mm. but let me just say this. Christ made only two ordinances for the, gave two ordinances to the church. One is communion, and that was to acknowledge his death. The other is baptism, which acknowledges his burial and his resurrection. And together they tell the atoning work that Christ has done for us. Now, in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is that a suggestion? Hmm. No. This is Christ's great commission That's to fine. the church. Yeah. And what we have to realize, baptism isn't going to save you, but baptism is the most crucial Act, your first act of obedience as a child of God. When you understand what God is doing and you've given your heart, you should be baptized. We looked at Romans 6, 3 through 6, that uh, for Annette's question, that baptism 
is signifying, it's actually symbolic of something God's doing in us when we are born again and we're trusting in his forgiveness that he's paid the penalty and it, it just symbolizes as we are buried in this watery grave, it symbolizes that we're going to put the past behind us. Yeah. God said, forget the past, don't dwell on it. Right. See, I'm doing a new thing in you. And suddenly it will spring forward. And then you come up out of the water in newness of life. Yes. See, baptism is a public confession mm. of Christ. It is so critical. Mm. Baptism is what joins us to the body of Christ. Mm. So now, the thief on the cross, did he have time to be baptized? Mm -mm. No. Was he saved? Yes. Mm -hmm. Jesus promised he would be with him in paradise by immersion. Is that important? If it symbolizes a death and a burial, and we see in Matthew uh, 3, 16, Jesus went down in the water and immediately came up out of the water to go into the uh, wilderness and be tempted. We see in Acts 8, 39, when Philip baptized the eunuch, we see that there was much this much water and it says that he went down in the water and he came up yes. out of the water. Mm -hmm. I do believe with all of my heart, a child cannot choose to be baptized. It's an act of faith. Mm -hmm. I do believe with all of my heart that what we should follow Christ's example, the word baptismo means to be submerged. Mm -hmm. What about sprinkling? The word baptismo, <laughs> fully <Yeah>. means <laughs> to be submerged in water. It is, yeah. it, it's symbolic that mm -hmm. we're laying down that old life. We're identifying with Christ. It's like a marriage, huh? Yeah, your commitment. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. This is your question, John. This is, okay. uh, here it is. What does one who, this is a quote, one who takes up the plow and looks back, isn't fit for the kingdom mean? Hmm. You know, that's from Luke 9:62. This is a, from a viewer from New Jersey. Okay, New Jersey, the tri-state area, as we used to say when <laughs> they yeah. the yeah. tri-state area. <laughs> well, thank you for the question from the tri-state area in New York City, mm -hmm. uh, in New Jersey. This is in fact, uh, Dr. Luke, I believe, has a number of examples to draw from. One of the earliest ones we find in scripture was the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, mm -hmm. Dr. Luke is the one that records this short phrase, remember Lot's wife. Yes. One of the shortest passages in scripture, remember Lot's wife. Mm -hmm. And the question is what happened to Lot's wife? Mm -hmm. Well, looking back is a symbolic comparison to if the Lord is calling you forward to safety and destruction is behind you, remember Lot's wife. Mm -hmm. What did she do? Mm -hmm. Genesis 19 verse 26. But his wife looked behind him and she became a pillar of salt. Mm -hmm. Frozen between safety and destruction. She never went to complete safety. She never fully escaped destruction. She was frozen in her decision. What was her last act? She looked back. Mm -hmm. And that's a sad reality. You know, if you're going to be, the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times. And a good friend of mine, you know, David Asherick says, if you're going to fall, fall in the direction of the kingdom. Oh, yeah. And so, but those who look back, the Bible made it very clear in Luke 9, verse 62, they are not fit for the kingdom. Why? Because they're thinking about what's behind them rather than what's in, uh, ahead of them. Uh, the example was given clearly when the Lord again told the Israelites uh, when they were being pursued by the Egyptians, the Egyptians were not allowed to catch up with them. The Lord protected them with a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. And he was always the wall between destruction and protection. And when they were frozen in their fear, Exodus 14, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel, go forward. Mm -hmm. And so we find that anytime going forward is re recommended, it's moving in the direction of the Lord. I press toward the mark, mm. pressing toward the prize for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, forgetting those things which are behind me. I think it's Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14, forgetting what's behind me, pressing to what's ahead of me. And then you also find going back as a symbol of apostasy, falling away. Mm. John 6, verse 66, mm. 
From that time, many of his, many of his disciples went back mm -hmm. and walked with him no more. Now, what happens, Peter also likens it to apostasy, but, it's, but it happened according to the true proverb, the dog returned to his own vomit and a pig having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Mm -hmm. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 22. Don't go back. You're going back to the worst things as well as you're going back to destruction. The recommendation to the children of Israel and to you is don't cry, go forward. Amen. There's a song we used to listen to. We fall down, but we, but we get up. up. That's right. Yeah, when you fall, do not stay down. That's right. Get back up no matter what you've done. Remember, you can get back up in Jesus. He will lift you and carry you all the way, but you got to trust him. Mm. Okay, let's go. All right, here we go. This is your four-minute question, James. Four-minute question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a short, short question, but it's a four-minute answer. All right. Okay, here we go. Must someone be a Seventh-day Adventist to serve God to go to heaven? This is a YouTube question. That is a big question. Mm. And of course, we need to answer that with an emphatic no. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to actually be of any denomination mm -hmm. in order to serve God and to go to heaven. You know, there's going to be a lot of people in heaven who weren't connected with any kind of denomination mm -hmm. per se. But we need to be really cautious here as we're going to see when we read these Bible verses. The first one I'd like to give you is in Zechariah chapter 13. You can read the entire chapter. It's all good. But verse 6 talks about one who says unto him, the Lord, what are these wounds in your hands? And he shall answer these with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. There are going to be people in heaven who are going to ask Jesus, what happened to him? Why does he have these wounds? Because we're told Jesus is going to bear the wounds of the cross for all eternity. And he's going to explain to them as he walks them by the river of life, he's going to explain to them the whole plan of salvation. They didn't know. Why not? Well, because according to Romans chapter 2, there are going to be people in heaven who didn't really know the law or the truth or understand all the things that the Jews understood or maybe that we understood, but they lived up to their conscience. Mm -hmm. They did what their conscience told them was right to do. Maybe they protected missionaries on their journeys and they, they took care, care of poor people who were hungry. They did what their conscience told them and their conscience became a law to them. Let's read the verses. Romans 2 verse 11, for there is no respect of persons with God, for as many as have sinned without the law shall perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing them witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile excusing or or accusing or excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now we know that n there is no salvation but in Jesus Christ, but the Holy Spirit is working on the hearts of every single person and revealing to them whatever they can handle of the light of Christ, the light of the everlasting gospel. And if they will walk in that light, he shows them more and more and more. And there are gonna be people in heaven who walked in as much light as God was able to show them and therefore they're going to be saved because Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. That's John chapter 10 and verse 16. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also must I bring and, there shall be, and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now we're transitioning into what I believe is an important uh, factor in the end of time. You see, God has a message that he's going to take to all the world. Revelation 18 talks about God's glory, light in the whole earth. And he's going to call all of his people out of Babylon, that is out of confusion. Yeah, there's lots of different folds, but God's going to have one fold in the end of time. Amen. And they're going to follow one shepherd in the end of time. And this everlasting gospel is going to go to all the world in the end of time. And when that happens, people are going to become enlightened with the gospel, with the truth of who Jesus is. They're going to accept him and they're going to become part of the body body of Christ. Now, Shelley mentioned earlier the importance of being part of the body of Christ. When we're baptized, we not only accept Jesus, but we can become part of the body of Christ. So I, I want to emphasize this now just to balance this out. We don't have to be part of a denomination to be saved, but if we have the light and the truth of church fellowship of the body of Christ, we should walk in that light and walk in that truth and become part of the body of Christ Amen. so that we can edify one another and build one another up and be directed by Christ who is the head of that spiritual body. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 
And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, we'll close with this verse. The early church was filled with the Holy Spirit. They were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were praising God. They were having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So may God add you to His church in these last days. Amen. Amen. Good answer. And we know in Acts 17, 30, at times of ignorance, God, God, God winked at. So but now He commands everyone to repent. Amen. 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 So heaven's going to be a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. Many people from throughout time will be there. And it's going to be exciting meeting all these people that are part of the family of God. Thank you. All right, Shelly, here we go. Can you explain, can you please help me to understand what spiritual pride is? This is from Marie in Papua New Guinea. Oh, Marie, what a wonderful question. Yeah. I'm sorry, I only have three minutes to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> spiritual pride. Yes. Um, it sounds like an oxymoron. If you were to add Christian in front of it, it is an oxymoron. It's, it would be, uh, it, it's not compatible. But what happens, we know Satan had spiritual pride, right? Yes, he, yes. he exalted himself. When someone boasts or feels superior to or exalts themselves or their self-righteousness, that's spiritual pride. You know, God's plan of salvation by grace through faith is very humbling. Mm -hmm. God expects us to depend totally upon Him and we don't take any credit for what He's done. When a person, say a pastor who has all of the talents and the possessions that God has given him, and he gives up and gives a great message and you go say, oh, oh, Pastor, that was such a wonderful message. Yeah, yeah. If he gets a little uh -huh. puffed up about it, guess what? You just made him have spiritual pride. Mm -hmm. And that we, none of us can take any credit for the gifts that God has given us mm -hmm. or as he has developed them. Now, yes, we're to cooperate, but no teacher of the word even has a reason for boasting. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul says, who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did not receive it, why do you boast mm -hmm. as if you had not received it? Boasting of any sort, right. that's deceitful. It leads us to yes. feeling superior. We've got to remember God is the giver of yes. every good and perfect mm -hmm. gift. Mm -hmm. Real quickly, I've got to read this. Yes. First Chronicles 29, 11 through 12. This is David praying and he says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty yes. for all that is in heaven and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you and you reign over all. We can't even feel prideful about the wealth that we have attained. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Mm -hmm. But get this, verse 14. We can't even be proud about our ability mm -hmm. to give or how much we give. Right. David says, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this for mm -hmm. all things come from you and of your own mm -hmm. we have given you. God provides everything. There's no room for spiritual pride. Amen. Wow, mm. well said. And you know, all of you are on 3ABN, you're seeing all over the world and people will come and say, oh, we just love your sermons. We always give it back to the Lord. Amen. That's right. Always Amen. give it back to the Lord. We say, praise the Lord. If he could use me, uh, what we always say, honey, I'm just the just lamp. lampshade. Jesus is the light. He's the light. <laughs> That's right. If you've just tuned in and you have Bible questions, you can text us at 618-228-3975 or you can email us if you prefer at BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. Okay, let's go to the next question. Honey, here's, this is your question. Please help me understand 1 Timothy 4, 3 to 5. Mm. But how do we explain these verses of scripture that use such plain language as to suggest we can eat anything as long as it is sanctified by the word through prayer? What do these verses really mean? This is from Brian in Spokane. 
Thank you, Brian, for that question. Now, there's a lot <laughs> to unpack in these verses. That's why I didn't take a lot of time to add a whole lot more verses because yeah. this verse is a mouthful to be very candid about it. Mm -hmm. So I'll just go ahead and read as we, lead in, as we lean into it. First Timothy chapter four, beginning with verse one. You know, somebody once says context, uh, text without context is pretext. Let's understand what Paul is telling Timothy. He is saying, now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. That is the purpose of, and he's gonna say, this is how you can identify those that are departing from the faith. That is what he's identifying. So he's saying, this is the list of things they will do, kind of like a Daniel 9, all the things that the Lord is going to accomplish or hopes to accomplish among Israel in a similar way. It says, they're gonna start by giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. That's the first thing. The other one, they're gonna be speaking lies and hypocrisy by denying the truth. The third one, their conscience will be seared with a hot iron, meaning they, know all, they are no longer receptive to the voice and the workings of the Holy Spirit. The other one, they forbid to marry and they forbid meat that are sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And that's the key because since we focused more on the meat part than the eating part, we'll spend a little time on the prior things. Uh, what this seems to suggest, as you put this in the context, if you put the whole picture together, somebody might say, well, as we get closer to the end, does it become permissible now to eat things in the latter times? That's not what Paul is saying. That's not what he's telling Timothy. He is saying, if you're gonna eat anything, make sure it is sanctified by the word of God. First of all, what does that mean, sanctified? Meaning God's word sets things aside. And when you follow scriptures, you find that throughout the Bible, from Genesis all the way through, uh, in the specifics, the things we can and cannot eat, God specified that through the Jewish nation intending to tell the world, as you find Acts chapter 13, verse 42 to 44 says, God intended them to be a light to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. So the Lord outlined clearly how he wanted our bodies to be treated. And the key issue is, does God's word sanctify what we eat? What does it mean? Set it aside and is it holy for food consumption? Mm -hmm. That's the key to it. The other thing is, if it is, then the word of God says, pray over it and thank the Lord for it. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that happened in the days of Paul were there were some Jews that were taking things to the market that had already been sacrificed mm -hmm. and it was a concern. So he says, is it sanctified by God's word? Yes. Mm -hmm. So then don't ask whether or not it's, uh, it was used for sacrifices. That was not necessarily the context for this particular scripture, but here's the key in summary. If God's word sanctifies it and sets it aside for food consumption, all you got to do is pray and thank the Lord for it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for that. Good answer. Okay. James Rafferty, here's your question. Is Proverbs 1, verse 20 to 32, talking about God or Solomon? It seems not to be God's character to, vin to be vindicate vindictive or mean-spirited. This is Trina from Mariposa, California. That's a great question, Trina, and I agree with you. It, it doesn't uh, line up with God's character to be mean-spirited or mm -hmm. uh, vindictive, but there are principles of God's character that are just and holy and righteous. Proverbs uh, chapter one is indeed God speaking, mm -hmm. uh, and he is speaking to Solomon and speaking to us through Solomon. Uh, verses 20 to 32. And the controversy really is over the character of God because God is both merciful and he is just and righteous and holy. And his character has been at the center of this great controversy. So sometimes when we read these Bible verses, we think, oh, that can't be God. And that's because perhaps we've been given a wrong picture of what God is really like. For example, um, God is sometimes pictured as being just, so just on the one hand that he can't be merciful or so merciful on the other hand that he can't be a God of of justice. Calvary kind of settles all of that because when you look at Calvary, you see God being just and God being merciful at the same time. You see justice and mercy being reconciled on Calvary. Jesus died in an act or a manifestation of God's mercy toward us. Jesus died in an act or a manifestation of God's justice towards sin. And so we see this reconciliation taking place on Calvary. And again, when you look at the Bible, you recognize that the revelation of God's character is this balance of justice and mercy. For example, the Ten Commandments. In commandment number two, 
Verse 5 of Exodus 20, it says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for, the, for I am the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So God is actually keeping record of and visiting iniquity upon people. But then he goes on to say, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. So there you have this justice and this mercy in the character of God. God is helping us to understand the balance or the tension between the justice and the mercy of his character. Mm -hmm. In a sense, you could say the emphasis in the Old Testament is God's justice and the emphasis in the New Testament, it's God's mercy. And both together bring us a full picture of who God really is. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that great answer. Okay, Shelley, this is your four minute question. Okay. Okay, here we go. Is it wrong to teach the things God has revealed to us concerning the prophecies of the last days, the commandments and the Sabbath? I was told if I was not considered a teacher, then God would hold me accountable. I take the text in Ezekiel 33 very seriously. And I believe as a faithful follower of Christ, I am bound to share the warnings of the signs of God's soon return. Rebecca from Oregon. Rebecca, I believe that's the loving thing to do. And let's look at scripture. First of all, Ezekiel 33 in context, it is speaking of the prophet that God holds accountable. If they, if God gives them a warning to tell the people to repent and the prophet doesn't, then God says, hey, if you don't give the trumpet a certain sound, yes. their blood's on your hands. So um, does that apply to us? Let me just set that aside for now. Mm -hmm. Here's the main thing. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is the Great Commission. When mm -hmm. Jesus said that he is telling us to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them everything that he wants us to obey, He's actually speaking to all of us. We all have that call mm -hmm. to fulfill the Great Commission. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, talks about the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the evangelists, the teachers. What is their job? They are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And he goes on in, in just a couple more verses saying, speak the truth in love so that we can all grow up. So I think the loving thing to do, if I saw someone heading toward a cliff or a, a washed out bridge, if I didn't warn them, that wouldn't be love. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14, 6. Here's what I want to say to you, Rebecca. Revelation 14, 6, we see through 12, the three angels messages. And you know what? If we only give the warnings, of the three angels' messages, nobody's going to listen. The three angels' message starts off. It says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to everyone, every tongue and tribe and people. So what we have to do, speaking the truth in love, before you can warn somebody, I mean, if you tell me don't take the mark of the beast and I don't know what, what the everlasting gospel is that yeah. Jesus died for me, it's meaningless. Mm -hmm. So we need to learn to share Jesus yes. first, then share the warnings. Mm -hmm. Revelation 12, 17 says the dragon was enraged with the woman. He went to make war with the rest of her offspring for those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The testimony of Jesus Christ were to be out testifying mm -hmm. about how our God came to earth, became a man, died for us, became our substitute to let people know how much he loves them. We know the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. It starts in Genesis and goes all the way to the end of Revelation. And you know, Paul says, how can people hear if we don't go somebody, we don't send somebody to them. Romans 10, 15, he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Do I believe that you don't have the right to share the prophecies or the commandments or the warnings? Absolutely not. I think it is your duty as a Christian. Just be sure that you're speaking the truth in love, that you're sharing the testimony of who Jesus is, 
before you give those warnings. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well said. And Jesus, as we know, John 10, 10, thief comes, steal, kill, and destroy, but God has come that we may have life and have it more abundantly. And this, these truths, the truth don't have us. Well, how do we always say that? Yeah, we don't have the truth. The, the truth, truth has, has us. us. That's right. what you always say, yeah. We don't have the truth, truth have us. Wow, well, what we're gonna do is take a short break, but when we come back, we're gonna get some closing thoughts from the panel. So we'll be right back. If you're enjoying our 3ABN Bible Q&A, then tell your friends. Each Monday, we'll bring you a fresh program answering the Bible questions you send us, using God's Holy Word to shed light on those texts that seem difficult to understand. To have your questions answered on a future program, just email them to us at BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. That's BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. You may also text your questions to 618-228-3975. That's 618-228-3975. Be sure to include your name and where you live, and then watch 3ABN Bible Q&A for answers from God's Word. I hope you were blessed. I sure was, and I always learn a lot when I listen to the panel from these wonderful answers for Bible Q&A. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any closing thoughts? Yeah, I have a thought I'd like to share with that last question because it was a difficult question, and that yeah. was about the character of God. Is He vindictive, et cetera? And oh, yeah. sometimes it's our perspective. Mm. You know, when I think about Christ hanging on the cross and crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken yeah. me? Mm -hmm. That seems a little vindictive. That seems a little mean-spirited. Why would God forsake his son right at the very time when right. Jesus needed him the most? But when you look into the heart of God and when you look into the, what was really happening there, God was actually right there at mm -hmm. the throne. He, I mean, yeah. at the cross, he was veiled in darkness. Yes. But Jesus, of course, couldn't feel his presence. And sometimes, you know, we f it's our feelings that disconnect us from God or make us misunderstand what God is really like. We've got to go to the Word of God. Amen. And the Word of God is very clear that God so loved the world that He gave His only Amen. begotten Son. God loves us and He does everything He can to redeem us. Yes. I love the story of Nebuchadnezzar when he was, you know, made crazy for seven years. Yes. And, you know, you think, oh, that's vindictive. That's mean-spirited. Why did God do that? Make him like an animal, you know, eating grass. Like, and, mm -hmm. But when he comes out of it, when Nebuchadnezzar comes yeah. out of it, he's like, <laughs> God is so good. Yes, he oh, God is good. He knows how to humble the proud. Mm -hmm. And he just, he knows what he's doing. I'm just going to trust him. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we need to go just to the word of God and trust God and not allow our feelings and the way we might think about him in a negative way to overpower the, the revelation of his love That's and, right. and his Amen. 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 Shelly, you have any closing thoughts? Just a quick one on the clean and sure. unclean. Oh, uh, yes. When I was studying in Genesis recently, uh, when God set aside clean animals and unclean. Clean means they're acceptable mm -hmm. to God. Unclean means they're not acceptable. Right. Clean means they are sanctified. So what is sanctified by the word of yes. God from 1 Timothy? We have to make sure that we're following God's counsel. Thank you. That's right. That's and, and the other thing is God created all creatures. So you might ask yourself, why would he create something that's clean and unclean for what? clean for consumption, unclean for consumption. Mm -hmm. God built into creation his own sanitation department. That's why the world's so beautiful, the forest, the, the wilderness, the ocean. So trust God's word and you'll always be guided in the right direction. Thank you so much, all three of you. You did a wonderful job and thank you. The Lord used you all in a beautiful way. Thank you. Until next time, you have a blessed day and read the word of God for nourishment. God bless you.